Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our webinar, Florida Health and Wellness. We are very grateful to have you back with us. Um, if you cannot hear me speaking right now and see the screen here, please go ahead and type no in the chat box. I'm Leilani Funaki from the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center. And uh, great, it sounds like you can, you can hear me. So wonderful. If you do find during the webinar that you're not able to hear or you have other technical difficulties, please reach out to Wendy Lebrecht. Her email address is there on the screen right now. Um, or you can also type any questions you have into the chat box. So today you won't be able to speak. Um, we don't have your microphones enabled. So this chat box here on the right side of your screen, that's, that's where you'll communicate with us. So any questions you have about the training, any help you need, please go ahead and type it right there into the chat box. Um, today's session is being recorded and will be posted on our website. Um, shortly afterwards. And also one thing to point out to you here, just below the chat box, we have our files to download area. So there will periodically be handouts that we'll reference. Um, in this first box here, we've got the pre-work assignment that was sent out to you when you were first registered. There's also um, a handout here that goes over any kind of uh, financial disclosures we need to make from anybody who was involved with planning the training content or anybody who is delivering the training. Today we don't have anything to disclose, but just so you know that information is there as well as a recap of the requirements for earning continuing education credits. You'll also see in this files to download box that the, uh, the training slides are there if you'd like to download them and follow along and take notes as well as uh, the case studies that we'll reference and once again any of the other handouts that we speak of. So. With that said, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn the time over to Beth Fenning. She is from the Office on Trafficking in Persons. Beth, over to you. Thanks, Leilani. Good afternoon, everyone. As Leilani said, my name is Beth Fenning, and I'm a program specialist with the Office on Trafficking in Persons. And on behalf of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center, I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's SOAR to Health and Wellness Training. Before we turn things over to the presenters, I wanted to briefly provide you all with a little background on this training today. In September 2008, the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation sponsored a national symposium with trafficking experts and medical professionals on the health needs of trafficked persons. And one of the major conclusions of that symposium was that training for both healthcare and social services fields on this issue was critical to increasing victim identification and ensuring that our service delivery as practitioners is trauma-informed. And the importance of such training was further reinforced by the Federal Strategic Action Plan on services to victims of human trafficking in the U.S. In recognition of the vital role you all play and to align with our mission to promote the health, safety, and well-being of the American people, the Administration for Children and Families and the Office on Women's Health designed an initial training in 2014, which has gone through piloting and enhancements that have really been informed by training evaluation feedback that we received to date and the expertise of trafficking survivors, social service providers, and healthcare professionals through two national technical working groups. So we have four sections for today's training that align with SOAR, which is an acronym that stands for STOP, Observe, Ask, and Respond. If you guys have any questions throughout today's training, I'd ask that you please submit them to everyone through the chat box that you see that Leilani pointed out with the green arrow. We have administrators, so both Wendy and Leilani will be compiling your questions for our trainers who will then address them at the end of each section. Um, we will also be offering you all two short breaks. We know this is a rather lengthy webinar. Uh, so we'll be taking a short pause after the stop and the ask sections. So our administrators will come back on the line and they will announce at what time we'll get started again. As a friendly reminder, uh, continuing education units are available for training participants who stay for the duration of today's training and successfully complete their online post-training survey form, uh, which will be sent out shortly afterwards. Um, and I would like to turn it over to Catherine and Elizabeth to briefly introduce themselves before we uh, move on. Aloha. My name is Catherine Gian with the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery here in Hawaii. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to present this awesome training for you all. Thank you so much. And hi, this is Elizabeth Corey. I am a survivor of family controlled sex trafficking and abuse, and I'm also a trauma expert and life coach for complex trauma survivors, and I'm really excited to be here presenting for you today. Thank you. 
And thanks, Leilani, and, or excuse me, thanks, Catherine and Elizabeth. We're looking forward to having your guys' expertise during this training. Before we begin, I was hoping to get an idea of the geographic diversity of our participants here today. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few seconds to look at the map we've put here and let us know what region or state and city you're from into the chat box. Region 7, 5, 10, 4, 2, great. That's terrific. We got a lot of people on the line here today. Thank you guys so much. So as Leilani mentioned, we did send out a, uh, some homework that you guys did not have to turn in, don't worry. Um, but it was really getting you all to think through your referral networks in your local communities and some of the key stakeholders that we feel are integral to having a, a robust safety net. Um, as Leilani mentioned, that resource is available for download in the download pod. And that's something that Catherine will be referencing during the respond section of today's training. So we just wanted to briefly have a hat tip towards that. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate everybody who is taking the time out to complete this training today. This is such important information for you to have. So thank you all for being here. We're going to start off just quickly by talking about the course objectives. And you know, it's important to understand, of course, why we're here. And we want to talk about what we're going to be accomplishing and that you should be able to accomplish by the end of the training. First, we're going to describe the types of human trafficking in the US. And then we're going to talk about recognizing possible indicators of human trafficking. We want to demonstrate how to identify and respond to potential trafficking victims, and then also to respond appropriately to potential human trafficking in your community. And lastly, we're, the objective today is to share the importance of human trafficking awareness and responsiveness with others in your work environment. So let's start off here today with a pulse check. And if you could, you should now see that there are um, questions or answers you can give down below. There's a little poll down there. The first question is, could you identify a potential victim of trafficking? And then have you ever encountered a potential victim of trafficking? So if you could just answer that poll, that should have popped up underneath the captioning for you. That would be great. And it looks like both answers are coming in with the yeses and the noes being close to even. And so that's good, to, you know, because if you were all here answering yes to this, then that would essentially mean you wouldn't need this training. So I really appreciate you being here and being willing to learn a little bit more about human trafficking today. Um, we do have a good number who are saying they could identify a potential victim of trafficking. It looks like right now it's coming in at about 56% um, and about 50-50 on whether or not you've encountered a potential victim of trafficking. So thank you guys so much for answering that. Next we're going to talk a little bit about the relationship between human trafficking and public health. In the past, we have typically thought of human trafficking um, and really molded our response to it from a perspective of law enforcement. And while this perspective is important, we now realize that human trafficking is also a public health issue. And it affects individuals, families, and communities across generations, entire generations. This graphic here shows terms that are related to both public health and human trafficking. Um, which of these public health issues relate to your day-to-day -day work? In this case, we don't have a poll. If you could just comment in the chat box, I'd love to get an idea for, for how you have seen this or how this plays out maybe in the particular job that you're doing now or have done in the past. In reproductive health, health care, maternal infant health, Infectious disease, social services, prevention, counseling, Indian child welfare, community resources, adult protective services,
Mental Health, Trauma, and Family, Department of Corrections. So it seems that we have quite a diverse group here today, crisis intervention, um, mental health, alcohol, women's health prevention, trauma, um, lots, of, lots of great answers and very, very diverse juvenile probation. So thank you guys so much for giving us an idea of, of the kind of experiences that you have. Um, one of the primary benefits of looking at human trafficking as a public health issue is the emphasis on prevention. That is, looking at the systemic issues that cause people to be vulnerable to human trafficking in the first place. Because trafficking does not happen in a silo. It is often one component in a series of traumatic and violent experiences over the course of a lifetime. So recognizing these risk factors is critical to prevention. So from the perspective of uh, public health prevention and human trafficking, um, the primary, <clears throat> and excuse me for my throat today, the primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention approach can be applied to human trafficking. And I want to give some examples at each level of prevention. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the public health prevention approach does the following. First of all, it focuses on prevention, interrupting violence, and changing social norms. So we're really getting at this from a ground level. Um, it recognizes the social and economic determinants of health and well-being that may lead to trafficking. It focuses on identifying protective and risk factors. Um, and it encourages culturally specific prevention and intervention efforts. It engages all essential community stakeholders who can play a role in addressing human trafficking. It builds community capacity and includes community members in the development of policies and practices. And it recognizes human trafficking along a spectrum of interrelated violence and systemic inequalities. And I think that is so key to looking at human trafficking in a different way. While there is a law enforcement component, and that is critical, I think we have to expand the way we examine human trafficking today. So let's talk about the SOAR framework. Um, you've already heard a little bit about how SOAR developed, but this training uh, that we're going to be seeing today is built on the SOAR framework, which was developed by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This framework provides a quick mental reference for professionals like you to keep in mind the best way to help a potential victim of human trafficking. So we're going to talk about this from four different angles. The first one is stop, okay, and that is to, that is we're going to focus in the stop section on becoming aware of the nature and scope of human trafficking. Then we will talk about observe, which is the um, section where we work on recognizing the verbal and nonverbal indicators of human trafficking. Then we will discuss ask, and that is identifying and interacting with a potential human trafficking victim. And then respond, where we will be talking about responding appropriately to a potential human trafficking victim. So the rest of this training is going to take a closer look at each of these areas. So let's get started with STOP. And here are the objectives for the STOP component of the SOAR framework. Um, first, we're going to be distinguishing between some of the most common misconceptions and realities of human trafficking. I'm sure as we get into this, um, you will see some misconceptions that you've heard and maybe that you even held yourself uh, in the past. We're going to recognize the potential for interactions with human trafficking victims on the job. I think you will leave here today realizing that it's, there's more potential than you thought when you started. Um, then we will explain the legal definition of human trafficking based on the TVPA, which was originally signed in 2000. Then we will identify the use of force, fraud, and coercion against potential human trafficking victims or minors who have signs of abuse and neglect. And then 
The last two things we will do is identifying common risk factors for victims of sex and labor trafficking and also identifying common relationships between traffickers and victims. So let's start off by talking about what your role is in the fight against human trafficking. Um, and I, I think this is important that you understand your role from a perspective of it will give you a better idea as to how to address what you are seeing in your job. So your role is to identify potential victims and respond appropriately, including treating, referring, and reporting when mandated by federal and state laws and tribal ordinances. Then it is to work with others in your profession to develop protocols for your workplace on how to help potential victims. And I, this is really important to stress is you're identifying potential victims. We are not asking you to leave here today and become um, an expert at you know, identifying without a doubt a victim of human trafficking. This is about really understanding the signs and understanding the misconceptions so that you can say this person might be a victim. So next we're going to start off with a case study, and this case study is, with, um, is about a, a girl named Liza. And after we've talked about that, we will be discussing the questions that you see. Okay, I'm going to be reading uh, Liza's case study, and if you'd like to follow along with me, the case study is available for download in the download pod right over here. Um, in the meantime, here, here we go. As an 11-year-old, I was one of six foster kids who were sold to men for sex by my foster mother's boyfriend. My foster mother and boyfriend needed to get money to pay for their addiction to heroin. No one in the foster system knew what was going on. Whenever we ran away, the police would return us to the same abusive foster home. We felt like we had no recourse since no one believed us when we said we were being hurt. By the time I was 12, I left the house for good and was on my own. I met a guy on the street who said he would take care of me, and I believed him. In actuality, he was a pimp and sold me to men for money. He had me moving around on a circuit, Chicago, Detroit, Indianapolis, and back to Chicago again. At first, he treated me nicely, just long enough to get me to do what he wanted. Then he turned mean, and if I didn't make enough money, he beat me mercilessly. I learned quickly how to keep my head down and make my daily quota. During this time, I was beaten, burned, raped, and assaulted, sometimes by my trafficker and sometimes by the guys who were buying me. Some of those wounds were treated by the grandmother of one of the pimps, who had been a nurse for 30 years. She had a setup in her basement, and the pimps brought us to her place whenever we were seriously injured. Sometimes I went to a local neighborhood health clinic, but no one ever asked what had happened to me, and if they did, I lied because I was afraid of my pimp. I knew he would beat me if I told anyone what was going on. And to this day, I have physical, mental, and emotional issues as a result of that time on the street. Thank you so much, Ulani. Um, let's talk about the questions that are here um, about that particular case study. And what I'm going to do is once again ask you guys to comment in the chat box. We'll be doing this several times today. So um, first off, if Liza came to your office or emergency department, how would you proceed? Assess for current safety. Call the police. Probing questions. I'd explain my role and ask what sort of help she was seeking. Open-ended questions. Assess for immediate safety needs. Liza would be referred to the medical unit and treatment services immediately probing questions and assess for safety. Complete a full psychosocio assessment alone with her. See, pro provide trauma-informed care. One of my favorite phrases right there. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And let her know she's in a safe place. See a lot of really good answers here. Um, definitely wanting to um, assess for safety as well as asking open-ended questions. 
Um, and so these are, these are really, really good answers. And we'll be honing in a little bit more on some of the techniques when you do encounter a potential human trafficking victim today. So I appreciate your answers. Um, and let's, let's talk about the next one here a little bit. <clears throat> what indicators would alert you that she might be a victim of human trafficking in the first place? Yes, definitely her self-reporting would definitely be an indicator. Injuries that are inconsistent with her story, coercion, injuries, affect, type of wound. <clears throat> Guardedness, incomplete answers to, you know, to the questions about her, about her injuries. Um, yes, the, the runaway, um, how she presents physically and the way she is handling herself. So these, um, as somebody mentioned also, if she has no ID, that, you know, that is potential truancy. These are, yes, yeah, so these are really good indicators, absolutely. And we'll be talking a lot about indicators today as well. Um, and then the last one is what questions would you ask her? Are you safe right now? <clears throat> Can you leave if you want to? Those are really, really good questions. Do you have somewhere safe to go? Has anyone asked you to do something you didn't want to do? Um, where you felt you couldn't say no? Where do you stay? Would you like help? That's a good question, too. A lot of times we assume they do. Do you have any positive support? Has anyone been forcing you to do something you didn't want to do? These are great questions, exactly. And we're going to be talking about questions today as well. And I think one of the critical components to understand is that they may not only be unaware of the term human trafficking, but they may even, um, even if they are being trafficked, may not consider themselves a victim of it. So it's really important. You guys really seem to have an understanding of that already, that you, you can't usually just come out and say, um, have you been trafficked? And not get the answer that you want anyway. Um, OK. So thank you guys so much for participating. We're going to be doing a little more participating in this section. So I appreciate you staying with me there. Um, thank you. So next we're going to talk about the definition of human trafficking. So to get started, basically according to the Federal Strategic Action Plan on Services to Victims of Human Trafficking in the United States, human trafficking is a crime involving the exploitation of someone for the purpose of compelled labor or a commercial sex act through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. According to the U.S. Department of State, a commercial sex act means any sex act on account of which anything of value is given to or received by any person. Now, where a person is younger than 18, it, a person who is younger than 18 is induced to perform a commercial sex act, it is a crime regardless of whether there is any force, fraud, or coercion. Okay. That's the official definition. Now we're going to do some true or falses. And these are not going to come up as polls. And so once again, I encourage you guys to answer in the chat box. So starting off, we're going to ask the question here, trafficking must involve movement across state or national borders. Is that true or false? Seeing a whole lot of correct answers here. <laughs> that is absolutely false. A person may be trafficked within his or her own neighborhood. Although tra transportation may be involved as a control mechanism to keep victims in unfamiliar places, it is not a required element of the trafficking definition. Um, 
and, and I think this comes back to the idea that human trafficking is not synonymous with smuggling or forced migration, which do involve border crossings. So thank you for all of the, your participation on that one. The next one here is men, women, boys, and girls of any age, nationality, socioeconomic status, ability, race, and ethnicity are trafficked. And I see lots of truths coming through, which is the correct answer. Um, you know, a lot of times we do focus on particularly vulnerable populations, especially in the media. But and, and there are trends. We definitely see that. But it's important to understand that trafficking crosses so many different types of our population, some more vulnerable than others. Okay. The next question here is, victims will ask for help if they want or need it. Right. I'm seeing a, a lot of falses here, which is great. Um, and I may have given this away on the last slide a little bit too, right, because I did talk about that idea that not only may they not know what human trafficking is, but they may also not even know that they are a victim of it. And, and, and not only that, but even if they do know, they may be under a lot of coercion to not say anything. So they do not necessarily immediately seek help or self-identify as victims of a crime. And this could be due to a variety of factors, including you know, fear of violence against themselves or loved ones, loyalty to the trafficker, lack of trust, self-blame, or they've been given specific instructions, instructions by the traffickers regarding how to behave when talking to law enforcement or social services. There is definitely a lot of, you know, mistrust that can come along with human trafficking victims. Um, it is important to avoid making a snap judgment about who is or who is not a trafficking victim based on first encounters um, because trust does take time to develop. So um, continued trust building and patience. And we're going to talk a lot about that also today in the ask section. Um, is really building that trust and having the patience to do that is critical to determining whether or not a victim is, is really actually a victim of human trafficking. And the last one, healthcare and social service professionals need to recognize signs of trafficking and respond appropriately. Most definitely, right? That's why you guys are here today. Absolutely. It, you know, it is it is not the health it is not the healthcare or social services professional's job to make a determination as to whether a person is actually being trafficked. Um, but you know, it is important to be able to identify potential human trafficking victims. So, thank you guys so much for your participation. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about identifying potential victims. Research has shown that victims of trafficking are highly likely to come into contact with someone within the healthcare system. A 2011 study interviewed foreign national survivors of sex and labor trafficking to investigate how many of them encountered healthcare professionals while they were trafficked. 50% encountered a healthcare professional during the time they were trafficked, and yet none of them was identified as a victim of trafficking during these encounters. Um, and then, in addition to that, in a 2014 study, researchers interviewed survivors of domestic sex trafficking and found that almost 88% had encountered one or more healthcare professionals sometime during the period in which they were trafficked. Again, none of them were identified as a victim of trafficking as a result of these encounters. Um, and so, the last thing that I wanted to mention on this topic is, is coming from my own personal experiences as a family controlled trafficking survivor. Most of my interactions were with, um, with non-abusive adults was through the medical and teaching professions with a little bit of access to social workers. And while some families who traffic have doctors in their own trafficking network, um, I believe that the medical community in some form is likely to see almost all family controlled victims at one point or another. So, next one here, who do they meet? You know, as we have seen, victims of human trafficking encounter a variety of healthcare professionals while actively being trafficked. 
And so this graph shows um, the results of another anonymous national health care survey of human trafficking victims that came out in 2014. The respondents were victims of sex and or labor trafficking. A total of 173 patients were surveyed, with 117 reporting that they saw a clinician while being trafficked. So some of the patients saw multiple practitioners during their trafficking time. And as you can see, emergency department is definitely the, you know, the top percentage here coming in at 55.6%. And that's followed by primary care physicians at 44%, OBGYNs at 26%, and dentists at 26%. So this is good information for us to have. Um, emergency department personnel are highly likely to encounter an individual being trafficked, and you can see that from these results right here. Um, but the findings of another 2012 study indicated that while 27% of staff understood human trafficking to be a problem among their emergency department population, only 19% felt confident or very confident that they could identify a victim being trafficked, and less than 3% had been trained on potential victim identification. And that's one of the reasons why programs like SOAR are so critically important. The lack of training increases the chances that a person being trafficked um, goes unidentified or is blame judged or misunderstood. So in addition, victims of other crimes such as domestic violence, child abuse, and sexual assault may also be victims of human trafficking, which may not be recognized by the healthcare provider. Um, because very, as I said earlier, very rarely is human trafficking something that we find in a silo. It is usually um, happening amongst other things. Um, as a matter of fact, in my family, uh, sex trafficking was a part of the picture, but domestic violence and child sex abuse were also rampant within my family. Um, and so even if I had been identified as a sex abuse survivor, um, that would have been at least a starting point, and certainly the human trafficking would have come out eventually. So let's talk a little bit more about the TVPA and the definition of human trafficking. Um, so here's sort of how it breaks down within the TVPA, which is um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, um, which was signed in 2000. And basically, this TVPA says that the crime of trafficking breaks down into three different parts. There's an action, there's the means, and there's the purpose. And in a court of law, one of each of these elements needs to be proven for a successful prosecution. The exception is that when minors, and that's anyone under 18 years of age, are induced into commercial sex, it is considered human trafficking no matter what the means. Um, so you do not have to prove forced fraud or coercion in that case. Um, so while we want to show you the legal definition, we do know it's not your role to make legal determinations. This is about identifying potential victims. Um, another thing that's important to note here is that while this is an American legal definition, human trafficking is global. It is a global problem. Sometimes you may even hear it referred to as trafficking in persons or TIP. Um, and it occurs in every country in the world, including the United States. So definitions are likely and well, are going to be different depending on what country you're working with. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about the means because this is actually going to be the most helpful for you to understand um, or to help identify a potential trafficking victim. Okay, so. It's important to know, though, that only one of these means is required from the perspective of, of a legal, you know, the legal definition. Um, and then in the case of a minor, you don't have to prove any of these means. It's that a minor who is being um, induced to perform commercial sex, you do not have to prove any of these means. So what I'd like to do now is if you could comment in the chat box examples of these different types of means, that would be great. I'd like to see um, how you would define it. And of course, you can see that we have some examples already up here. 
But what is force fraud and coercion to you? Force is sexual assault or any sort of physical violence. Kidnapping. And then we've got um, lying about a promised job, which could um, be a fraud situation, and withholding legal documentation often um, can be coercion or fraud. Um, promises of providing for their family, that can, that can be a fraudulent situation. Um, what else we have here? Oh yes, and uh, making them think that you love them. Absolutely, that's actually a very, very common one, especially in sex trafficking situations where um, pimps start off um, pretending to be the boyfriend. Um, threatening, absolutely, that's coercion. Um, threatening to kill a family member, absolutely. Taking someone's passport or ID, that is absolutely, that's a huge one. And um, that's something that a lot of times we face in the labor trafficking community. Um, promising payment but withholding payment. So yes, these are some great examples of, of what we're talking about with, uh, with the means. So thank you guys so much for answering that. So next we're going to talk a little bit about vulnerable populations. Um, while we said earlier that human trafficking can affect anybody, and it does, there is also some, we have to consider the fact that there are populations that are more vulnerable. And that's important when we're looking at identifying people who are potential victims is to know, you know, they, it might be more likely if they fall in one of these vulnerable populations. Of course, it's not always obvious that they do. And so we also have to really be open-minded about um, whoever we're working with. So to start off with, you see this list here in front of you, but I'm going to highlight a few here. Um, first, you know, children in the United States are at particular risk for sex and labor trafficking, especially those who have been abused, are runaway or homeless, and those involved in systems such as foster care or in juvenile detention. Um, as a matter of fact, in my own life, I chose to run away one time, and I was out of the house no more than 15 minutes before I was approached by a trafficker. Um, and this person actually knew me and had watched me and um, knew that there was something going on that was wrong in my house. It was almost like he was just waiting for me to walk out the front door. So. I think that you know, we really do have to look at the runaway and homeless youth as well as the foster care community when it comes to children. Very, very, we need to pay close attention there. Um, child labor trafficking cases have been identified in agricultural work, restaurants, peddling, and begging rings. Um, so it's, we also have to consider the fact that children are not just being trafficked for sex, but that many are being trafficked for labor. Um, another group that I think it's important to highlight here is the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or questioning communities. Um, they are at high risk for exploitation, especially coming back to the homelessness, if they are thrown out of their houses for being gay, bisexual, or transgender. Um, for example, many youth in this category reported that they had to trade sex for food, clothing, and shelter and, and were targeted for being trafficked into prostitution. Um, the, as, we've, as we've said, also, another important group that I want to highlight is the Native American population. This includes American Indian, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. These populations face the same challenges as other vulnerable populations, but they also have unique risk factors, which include inadequate law enforcement, um, so crimes can go unreported. And they're also dealing with generational trauma. Um, and so I actually want to spend just a minute talking about generational trauma, because, <clears throat> excuse me, intergenerational trauma is something that we need to be on the lookout for, and it is not 
specific to certain ethnicities and races. Um, the trauma of war and immigration can affect generations. The effects of um, you know, large traumas on populations, for example, slavery and the Holocaust and other large-scale traumas um, affect specific populations, but they're present for generations and generations. Um, and it's not just the one type of trauma that we're working with here. Um, it can be a compilation of many different types of traumas that have added up over time. So, um, so it's really important to be aware of these vulnerable populations, but then also to understand that you may or may not be able to fully identify whether or not somebody falls in one of these categories. Okay, so now we're going to talk about one of my favorite studies, um, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. <clears throat> this is one of my, th this study, I just, I can't say enough about what it has done for get, gaining an understanding um, across the community for how trauma impacts a person holistically. So I think it's just so critical that everybody be familiar with the ACE study. And if you haven't taken the ACE study, I encourage you to go and take this. Um, take the, it's, it's a 10 question test, which will take you all of five minutes to take. Um, and I think it's important that we all know what our ACE number is. Um, I have, you know, this is the, what I like to say about this particular test is it's the only one I ever got a perfect score on. I do have an ACE score of 10. Um, and if you look at the studies that have been done on what the ACE score does in the long term to an individual from a perspective of physical illness and, and just general inability to function in society, um, I should be a, a hardcore mess at this point. So I'll just put it that way. I really think it's important now that everybody knows their ACE score. And if you're working with people on a long term basis, it's really good to know theirs as well. Um, there are three types of ACEs. And those include abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Um, so an abuse can be physical, emotional, or sexual. Neglect can be physical and emotional or emotional. And house dysfunction includes things like mental illness, incarceration, um, mother being treated violently, substance abuse, or divorce. So um, if you've never looked into the study, I, I highly recommend that you take a look take a look at some of the studies that have been done and some of the um, issues that have been attributed to high A scores. Um, so now we're going to do another quick pulse check here, and this one we do have a poll for. So if you could answer the following question here, which is um, which vulnerable populations are you most likely to encounter during your workday? We're seeing a lot are checking individuals with childhood abuse and neglect. Got almost 75% checking that. And then we've also got children involved in the foster care and juvenile justice systems with the next highest number coming in at about 42%. Runway, r runaway and homeless youth also coming in in 32% range. Let's see. Oh, we've got uh, people with low incomes at 63%. Um, racial and ethnic minorities at 50, undocumented immigrants at 46%, and then LGBTQ at 40%. So those are some of the biggest ones that we're seeing here. <clears throat> so, and this is important. It's important to understand that these are the populations that are the most vulnerable. Um, So now I'm going to talk about my favorite slide in the entire SOAR uh, presentation. And the reason I love this slide may be obvious based on what you know about me thus far, um, but I think it's critically important for us to understand the relationship between victims and traffickers for so, so many reasons. 
certainly identifying victims, we must know this information. Um, you know, one of the biggest stereotypes we have is the nature of the relationship between the trafficker and the victim. Um, the relationship of the trafficker to the victim varies, yet a 2013 study by Covenant House in New York notes, uh, shows some noteworthy findings. And just to give you a little background in Covenant House, they're a service provider for homeless youth in New York. Um, the agency often comes into contact with underage victims of sex trafficking. These youth are also referred to as domestic minor sex trafficking victims, or DMST victims, if they are U.S. citizens. <clears throat> the study by the Covenant House collected data on the relationship between traffickers and the DMST victims. The most striking finding was that 36% of the children in this study were trafficked by their parents or immediate family members. While this study is specific to the use of Covenant House, it reminds us not to discount someone as a potential victim just because they appear to be with a relative. This may be a legitimate relative, um, and they may even have proof of that relationship, but it doesn't mean they aren't being trafficked. Um, and I think it's also important to note that boyfriends at 27%, this could be um, a romantic partner, but in many cases, it is also a euphemism for trafficker. Um, you know, many traffickers do start off the relationship with their victims pretending to be a boyfriend. So this study is really critically important for us to understand the domestic relationship between victims and traffickers, because so often we, we hold this belief as a society that trafficking is happening because of the white van at the playground, the kidnappings, and, and that just isn't the majority of the cases that we're seeing. So this is, we're going to wrap up the stop section now, and so we'll do a quick summary. Um, <clears throat> human trafficking is the willful exploitation of another human being, and that is the action, by force, fraud, or coercion, which is the means for personal benefit, and that is the purpose. It's important to understand that definition and the fact that it has these different sections and is broken down into those areas. Um, healthcare professionals have an opportunity to recognize signs of trafficking and become a first line of appropriate response for potential trafficking victims. It is the TVPA, which defines, our, defines human trafficking for us in this country. Um, trafficking does not require transportation of victims. And victims do not usually self-identify as victims or seek help. Um, the appearance of consent by a victim does not disqualify an occurrence of trafficking. And the common at-risk factors for human trafficking include socio low socioeconomic status, familial and partner violence, childhood neglect, and minority status. Traffickers often have personal relationships with their victims prior to exploitation. So with that said, I am going to turn it over for us to take a short break. Thanks, Elizabeth. Just so you all know, we'll take a five-minute break. So we will get started with the observe section at 1.55 Eastern time.
Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and restart our training. Welcome back from our break. We're going to turn the time over to Catherine now, and she'll be covering the observed section of today's training. Catherine, it's all yours. Okay. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm a little under the weather, so if I inadvertently cough into your ears, I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> Um, the objectives for the stop portion of the SOAR, SOAR, SOAR framework uh, include explaining patient and client related barriers to potential victim identification. Um, they also explain, include explaining provider related barriers to potential victim identification and identify physical and behavioral health indicators of potential human trafficking victims. So I'm just going to throw a discussion point out there. Um, we're going to start by asking if you can name some patient or client-related barriers that prevent disclosure or identification of human trafficking suspicions. In other words, what are some c common reasons a person who is being traffic trafficked might not reach out for help, according to you all? Okay, go. Fear is a, a very big one. Language barriers, yes, absolutely. Lack of provider competency, absolutely. <laughs> That's why we're all here. <laughs> Constantly accompanied by abuser, absolutely, for sure. Um, prior bad experience with a provider. Mm -hmm. They think they're in love, yeah. Stockholm syndrome, in other words. People not believing them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, all good answers. So the reality is that many potential victims are not being recognized, unfortunately. This is often due to various barriers that hinder identification. These barriers fall into two categories, patient or client-related and provider-related barriers. Patient or client-related barriers are very numerous. One of the most important barriers is that clients rarely see themselves as victims. I mean, if you think about it, who wants to identify as a victim? Um, I don't know anybody, uh, survivor or not. Many have normalized their exploitation and don't understand that they are being victimized um, or used in a crime. And this is a basic survivor um, coping mechanism. They may also not understand the phrase trafficking victim and or may have no personal knowledge of what human trafficking actually is. Other barriers include fear of their trafficker or fear of deportation if they reveal what is happening to them, a dis distrust of those in authority, including healthcare and social service professionals. Uh, this may keep them from talking about what is happening. In this category, patients or clients may have had previous poor experiences with providers with a, uh, which a few of you already brought up in your response. A lack of knowledge of U.S. laws may also make it difficult for people to understand what is happening to them, that what is happening to them is actually illegal, or they may think signed documents legitimize their victim victimization. Foreign-born victims may have limited language profici proficiency or have difficulty explaining complex emotional trauma. It is also possible for victims, often international rather than domestic, to be illiterate and unable to read pamphlets or posters about trafficking that may be in the office or waiting room. Language barriers also include mistranslation during the translation process or lack of appropriate interpretation. I'd also like to interject here that translators, access to clean, fair, good translators is also at times a challenge. In smaller communities or in small cities, these immigrant populations usually know one another. The trafficker is usually involved in these communities. And translators or access to translators can be abused and manipulated by the trafficker. In other words, you may get a translator who sympathizes with the trafficker and screw up your entire case. So keep in mind, that has been an issue. So uh, types of barriers, let's move on. What are provided related barriers that prevent identification, uh, that uh, prevent the recognition of human trafficking? I'm sorry. P 
Provided related barriers include a lack of knowledge about human trafficking. Professionals cannot recognize something that they do not know about. This is why training on human trafficking is extremely important. Another barrier can be misclassification of the case. And this can occur when, for example, a sex trafficking case is seen as a domestic violence case, particularly where the potential victim is romantically involved with the trafficker. Some domestic violence victims may actually be human trafficking victims. Judgmental attitudes may cause providers to view potential sex trafficking victims negatively, for example, as dirty or drug addicted or quote unquote bad kids. Some professionals dismiss potential victims as criminals or treat them poorly as a result of societal stigma about prostitution. Um, it is important to think about barriers that we witting, wittingly and, or unwittingly create that may prevent identification of potential victims of human trafficking and to do as much as possible to remove these barriers for the sake of the victim. Now, we all have prejudices. I'm going to be blunt here. Um, we need to drop those prejudice, prejudices at the door when assessing and helping these survivors. As social workers, you see potential trafficking victims in your everyday work. Potential victims are often uncovered through investigations into child abuse, housing code enforcement, worker safety, and other problems in which social workers are involved. Social workers can help in many ways. Uh, one, you can identify potential victims of trafficking and help them obtain assistance, emergency services, and long-term care. Serve in organizations that specialize in assisting trafficking victims and improving upon the current promising practices of rehabilitation and reintegration. Educate vulnerable populations about the dangers of human trafficking as a form of prevention. Provide culturally specific and trauma-informed services to victims, which is extremely important. Build a coordinated community response to human trafficking. Advocate for policies that respond to human trafficking. And develop referral networks for victims and survivors. The list goes on, but I'm sure you can add to that on your own time and get creative, because it takes a village, literally. Best practices in helping potential trafficking victims to rebuild their lives are still being researched, tested, and written. Therefore, social workers have a great role in identifying promising practices, improving upon them, and reporting lessons learned with other practitioners. Social workers can encourage colleagues, administrators, managers, and others in their workplace to become knowledgeable about human trafficking and to incorporate incorporate prevention and other best practices into their workplaces. Now, despite legislation outlawing trafficking, finding and helping potential victims is a very complex process, or can be. Most trafficking victims don't understand their rights and are fearful of people in law enforcement. Um, fear repercussions to themselves and their families and are not aware of agency or community resources that may advocate for them. Furthermore, they may be deported as illegal aliens, quote unquote, if they refuse to testify against their trafficker. Um, social workers serve as a key access point to services in the social and healthcare system. They also have an important role to play in helping to identify individuals who may be trafficking victims and assessing them to obtain needed services. Learning to ask the right questions and looking for small clues that may suggest a person is coerced into a life of sexual exploitation or forced labor forms the basis for identifying a potential victim. A victim typically experiences psychological trauma that can upset the individual's physical and mental ability to respond to stress and danger. So they really need advocates, especially in, at first contact. In, this in turn can lead to the survival reactions of fight or flight or freeze, often making it difficult to diagnose an individual's needs. Um, I'd also like to add in that if you do uh, have a, an issue of 
a quote unquote illegal alien and you they're worried about deportation if you do have a free legal services agency such as legal aid in your city or a pro bono a public um, advocacy law firms they can protect and help identify human trafficking victims and, and give some layer of protection from deportation by filing a T visa for trafficking victims of this sort. Red flags that may indicate, um, there's a variety of red flags that may arise while getting a patient's history that can be indicators of either sexual or labor trafficking. And you can see these uh, red flags here listed um, by the types of services, physical health, behavioral health, social services, and public health. But there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to go through these columns rather than repeat them, but I'd like to also bring back Elizabeth to uh, highlight one of the nuances regarding the education system. Elizabeth. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, you know, these red flags, it's really important for us to understand that red flags, um, they can be really all over the board when it comes to indicating human trafficking victims. And what we're trying to do here is identify potential human trafficking victims. So I think it's important for us to be flexible around them. And one of the things that was certainly the case for me as a family control victim of trafficking and has been the case for many of my clients that I work with who have also been trafficked and sexually abused by their families is that education was actually a bit of a safe haven and it became a, a part of our lives where we could excel and understand the rules when we couldn't um, at home, for example. And so I have many, many, many examples of people who were trafficked by their family but actually excelled in school because that was sort of the place where everything just made sense and, and they could really come into and, and you know, be, some, be something and someone positive. And, and so it's very important that if you feel like um, you have a potential uh, human trafficking victim, but they're doing very, very well in school, and, and it doesn't appear that they're having problems with that, it's important to not allow that to sway you. So I, I like to bring that up because I know so often we use, tra we use education or failing grades as a reason um, or an indicator for human trafficking. So I like to point that out. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks, Elizabeth. A really good point. Um, let's see, next slide. So in contradiction to what uh, Elizabeth said, and she makes a really great point of some of the nuances that can be exceptions to the rule, academic problems may not be a, an indicator, but uh, sometimes can. It really just depends on the, the survivor, the victim. Um, I'd like to also highlight that there are high-risk victims identification programs that are in use by law enforcement, such as in the Dallas PD. They kind of red flag kids that they have seen run away three or more times within one year with a history of either sexual abuse or drug addiction. It has to be with one of those two other factors. It can't just be repeat runaways, um, just to throw that out there. In addition to these general red flags, Children often have particular red flags you should uh, be aware of. The Human Trafficking Task Force in Texas guides for their educators, highlights that no one indicator or group of indicators can confirm a trafficking case. And like Elizabeth said, it's not your job to uh, define and identify uh, conclusively uh, a human trafficking victim. All you, ha all you need to do is see the signs and propose that uh, this child or adult is either at high risk or probably is being trafficked. Um, the onus is not upon you to de define that. And I would say even more so, step away from any conclusive um, uh, you know, statements that may pigeonhole or give a false uh, positive, uh, which can be very problematic within the system, especially when working with law enforcement. They don't like being uh, seen as working with any agency or social worker that may be wrong uh, along the line of human trafficking. The indicators are warning signs, especially if school staff 
in the education system recognize new behaviors for a student in addition to the student um, suddenly having more expensive material possessions. Often children don't have the vocabulary to express or describe their trafficking system. Um, some of those material possessions may include jewelry and definitely cell phones or multiple cell phones. While we understand that any one of these could be present for an individual as far as physical signs of trauma um, as potential indicators, no single issue is indicative of trafficking, um, but putting different pieces together should increase our index of suspicion. Physical indicators for victims of sex or labor trafficking may include dental injuries or neglect, such as cavities, missing or broken teeth, uh, trouble swallowing, temporal mandibular joint disorder, or TMJ, or voice changes. Uh, tattoos often located on the neck or lower back or really anywhere. Sometimes they're um, not visibly seen very well, like in the inside of the mouth even, or in the hairline. Uh, domestic traffickers commonly have the victims under their control tattooed or branded with their street name or some symbol or phrase that communicates that they belong to that particular trafficker. Any tattoo that states property of or daddy is also obviously highly suspicious. Unusual infectious diseases such as TB or infectious diseases that are normally prevented by immunization are also a red flag. This is more likely with foreign national victims, however. Um, scars from cigarette burns, which are often in inconspicuous areas such as the lower back or feet. Suspicious injuries such as fractures, con concussions, bruises, or mutilations. Some individuals in the commercial sex industry are beaten in such a way, however, as to preserve their physical appearance. So you might not see any uh, markings or of abuse. One type of beating is, it, that is common worldwide involves uh, caning the soles of the feet. Um, it's extremely painful, yet preserves their appearance. Other methods include putting a, a victim in a tub of ice for long periods of time or putting them in a dark room with no light, uh, no ventilation, um, sort of like solitary confinement. Those are very traumatic forms of torture, but they leave no mark. Neglected chronic illnesses or pain such as back pain, arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, that has not been well managed. Other conditions um, seen may include lead poisoning, heat exhaustion, and uh, silicosis from certain labor roles, especially in a uh, factory or the farm industry where they're exposed to extremely noxious pesticides leading to some serious um, health-related symptoms and diseases. There are certain physical indicators under the category of, oops, I think that is the wrong slide, here we go. Sorry. Oh, I read the case study. Okay, sorry. I think I might have the wrong uh, PowerPoint um, with me, but I can roll with this. <laughs> Here's a case study of Janet. Um, if I can get Leilani to read her case study, we can go into her situation, and then I can ask you some discussion questions about identifying the force, fraud, or coercion used in this case, and what kind of barriers she encountered. No problem. And then for those of you listening, if you'd like to download the case study to read along with me, um, it's there in the files to download uh, box just underneath the chat pod. So Janet's case study reads, I am part of the Klamath tribe of American Indians. My father was the first tribal member to go to college and was a Klamath leader. I believe that the burden of his responsibilities contributed to the physical abuse that my five siblings and I experienced at home. We pretended to be a model family by getting high grades and doing extracurricular activities after school, but behind closed doors we were ashamed and living in an abusive home. As a young child, I was told that I would be taken away if I disclosed my sexual and physical abuse to anyone. I blamed myself and was suicidal and began cutting myself by the time I was 11. After several bad relationships, I got married, but I left my husband when he also became abusive. I moved back to my reservation with my children and then to Portland, Oregon to look for work. In Portland, I met a woman who offered to watch my two small children and let us live with her while I looked for work. 
This woman was a former prostitute, and her brother was a leader of the local Crips gang. Soon after I arrived, the brother started living in her apartment, and I was initiated into the gang by being raped by 10 of its members. They told me that I was now a gang member, and I couldn't leave them until I died. I was locked in a room, let out only from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. each night to work as a prostitute. I couldn't come back to the apartment each day until I had slept with about 15 men. I was never alone on the streets, and if I didn't bring enough money back, the woman's brother, who had become my pimp, would beat me. My children were left at the house while I was walking the streets so that my pimp knew I would come back, and he was paying his sister with drugs so that she would watch the children, um, and I knew I had to get out for my children's sake. One day, a social worker came to the apartment to perform a child welfare check. I was let out of my room to talk to the social worker, who said there were reports of gang activity in the apartment and no food for the children. She didn't ask if I was being abused, but did ask if I was a Native American. When I said yes, she automatically gave me a referral for drug treatment. A couple of weeks later, a customer tried to rob me, and when I fought back and he stabbed me several times, excuse me, when I fought back, he stabbed me several times. I was covered with blood when I went back to the apartment, but was just told to go take a shower and get back to work. The police arrested my pimp soon after this, and they called my parents to come and get me. I met with a treatment worker who realized that I didn't have a drug issue, but had been severely abused. He referred me to a women's support group, and that's where I started my healing journey. My children and I entered a 14-month shelter program, and that's where I was able to work on my post-traumatic stress disorder, gain job skills, meet with other survivors, and begin to trust myself for the first time. Okay, so social workers, you have been assigned to check a report of gang-related activity and, and children with no food in an apartment. Identify the force, fraud, or coercion used in this case, and what barriers um, came between Janet and, and you. Do you think those barriers could be overcome, and how? Okay, go. Behavioral health professionals, you have been assigned to meet with Janet regarding a drug referral, but you qu quickly realize she does not have a substance abuse problem. Same questions in the slide. Trust issues is number one, yeah, for sure, uh, which is why it's really, really important that you develop skills to be able to establish trust in a safe environment, which is extremely critical for the first meet um, and subsequent meets of, of, for that matter too. Other people listening in on the conversation, if you're the victim being beaten, if she says the wrong thing, absolutely. Physically and uh, verbally abused. Kids held captive, yeah, absolutely, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a real good reason why um, they would give the wrong answers consistently. Paying attention to body language. Keep on responding because these are really awesome responses, uh, but I'm just going to go on. You can read each other's uh, responses, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the question box. And we'll address them after the section. You guys are doing really great, by the way. OK, to wrap up the observed section. Let's review some key points we've covered in this section. Numerous barriers prevent proper recognition of human trafficking in healthcare settings. Patient or client barriers could include fears, distrust, shame, unawareness of rights, and other complications. Provider-related barriers include misclassification, unawareness of signals, uninformed attitudes, fear of professional ramifications, and other challenges. When providers are aware of the common indicators of human trafficking, this understanding helps generate a quicker response to potential human trafficking cases. I'd like to also add in real quick that um, your role as a social worker or healthcare provider uh, elevates your status in the eyes of a lot of these victims, especially children. So your assessment and your judgment carries some weight, whether you want it to or not. And they will be hyper vigilant on how you look at them, how you may be judging them. So it's always best to come in on the first meet uh, with no judgment and, if, and an air and a, a vibe of acceptance 
and calm, and they will pick up on that. Um, that's extremely, extremely important. If you've had a long day and this is your 30th case uh, that you're assessing, maybe you want to pass it off to somebody else who actually is a little bit fresher and hasn't been on the job for so many hours. Okay, that concludes our section of the observe, and I think we're taking another five-minute break. Is that right, Leilani? We are, yep. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that section. So once more, a five-minute break. We'll be back here and ready to start again at 2.26 Eastern Time.
Okay, and we are back from our break here with the Ask section. And this time around, Elizabeth will be delivering this for us. We'll turn the time over to her now. Thank you so much, Lilani. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Ask Now, which is really how we identify um, and interact with potential human trafficking victims. So the objectives of the Ask section are really about we're, we're committing to treat a potential victim using a victim-centered victim treatment best practices, okay? So, and, and one of the things we're going to talk a lot about today is a trauma-informed care approach. Another objective is to identify the elements needed to establish a safe environment. And then the third objective is to apply victim-centered interview techniques, such as those described in the Trafficking Victim Identification Tool, otherwise known as the TVIT, or other interviewing tools. So let's start off talking about when, when we say victim-centered approach, what are we saying here? All professionals involved in human trafficking cases must advocate for the victim. We want to avoid activities that can ostracize a victim or those that mirror the behavior of a trafficker however unintentionally, by limiting or not offering the victim's choices in the recovery process. It will require patience, empathy, and compassion from you, as well as from your partners involved in the effort. One of the key words I like to use when I describe the idea of a victim-centered approach is autonomy. Okay, it's really critically important that we begin to look at how can we provide autonomy to this victim because it may be the first autonomous experience they've ever had. So what do we mean by trauma? In short, trauma is an experience that overwhelms one's ability to cope. Anyone can be affected by trauma, individuals, families, or communities. Vulnerable populations, especially children, girls, and women, youth, LGBTQ persons, persons with disabilities, and older adults are disproportionately affected by trauma. That being said, I want to reiterate something we talked about a little bit in uh, the stop section, which is that just because they may not fall into a typically vulnerable population, doesn't mean that they haven't experienced trauma. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when I'm working with my clients, I refer to the phrase trauma doesn't mean drama because we've come to understand trauma as something that is a massive event in somebody's life. For example, obviously trafficking would be one of those things. Um, but we have to look at trauma not as an event but as a response. Okay, the trauma is the resulting response that the person has. And so a person can, go, two people can go through the exact same event and it could create a traumatic response in one person, but not in the other. So we really have to look at trauma as, as something, as a little bit different than sort of what I think is stereotypically described as trauma. So. Trauma-informed care falls under the umbrella of victim-centered care. A trauma-informed approach can be implemented in any type of service setting or organization and is distinct from trauma-specific interventions or treatments that are designed specifically to address the consequences of trauma and to facilitate healing. Trauma-informed practices can and should be used in an organization. Here are, I'm going to give you a few examples of ways that organizations and providers can implement a trauma-informed care approach. First, reflecting the principles of a trauma-informed approach throughout the organization's policies, program designs, services, and spatial environment. Okay, so why would we want to do that? Well, let's face it. We didn't go into, help, into the helping profession because our own lives have been perfect. We help because we get it. The best helpers do. But that means we have to address trauma for clients and staff. 
Because as I said earlier, trauma doesn't necessarily mean drama. A lot of us have had traumatic responses to events in our lives, whether or not we have been trafficked or sexually abused or been through war or something that horrific. We'll, we have almost all experienced some kind of traumatic response during our lifetime. So if we can be looking at how we can help staff to feel that they're safe, we're going to be able to provide a much safer environment for victims of trauma who are coming in for services. So the next thing is that we want to foster the core principles of safety, voice, and choice. This comes right back to autonomy in many ways. We want to allow uh, victims who have come in to get help to feel that they have a voice in what's happening, that they have a choice in what's happening, and that they feel safe to also express that. This is really a critical point. Next. Establishing trusting, respectful, and collaborative relationships. Now, we are going to talk a bit more about establishing trust later, but there's one term that I um, really love to use when I talk about this, and that is it's called transformational relationships. Because when we can provide an, a trusting, respectful, and collaborative relationship with a victim, what we're doing there is we are transforming the way they see relationship. More than likely, many human trafficking victims have never had a relationship like that. Had a relationship like that. And now I'm hearing myself in echo. Hopefully you guys aren't. OK. Um, so it's really important when we can begin to help them to see a relationship in a different way. Um, I know that when I was going through therapy, this was a critical thing that happened in my relationship with my therapist where I began to feel like, oh, look, I can have a relationship that's very different from anything I'd ever experienced before. The next point I wanted to bring up is establishing and maintaining transparency in actions and interactions. Okay, I just want to throw out this little piece of advice, which is no white lies, even when we think it's in the best interest of the client. Because I can tell you from my own personal experiences that hypervigilance is real. And those of us who have been through trauma, we really, have, we really know how to do this, OK? And what I mean by that is that a trauma survivor is going to pick up on everything, everything. So even though you may think that you've covered yourself in that little white lie, there is a good chance that the trauma survivor is going to figure it out because honestly, they even figure things out that aren't there. So they are certainly going to figure out the things that are. So this is about being as absolutely transparent in your actions and interactions as you possibly can be so that they feel as safe as possible. And then the last thing I wanted to share for this slide is that we need to be sharing information in an ongoing and consistent manner. Many survivors carry beliefs that relationships might start out OK, but they won't end that way. And when you think about the standard pimp manipulation narrative that we often hear about, where it starts out really nice and lovely, and then it goes downhill very, very quickly, that's exactly what's happening to a lot of relationships for trafficking survivors. So this is about being in it for the long haul. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the trauma-informed approach. You'll see in front of you that we have a list of six principles of a trauma-informed approach. Um, trauma-informed care promotes maximized healing and minimized re-traumatization in the delivery of a broad range of services. And those can include anything from behavioral health, substance use, housing, vocational or employment support, domestic violence and victim assistance and peer support. So this approach, I'm going to talk about some different aspects that this approach helps us with. And the first one is that it supports emotional safety for victims and staff. <clears throat> and as I said before, remember that everyone has trauma to some extent. So we're really looking to provide safety on all levels. Um, and that's especially true within the helping profession. The next thing is. Provide, you know, providing information about trauma to victims. 
This is a really critical point, and it's something that I face a lot within my own work because the name of my business actually has the word trauma in it. And I often hear from my clients um, that they weren't going to contact me originally because they didn't think that what they had was trauma. And so being able to help trafficking victims not even understand that they were trafficked, but to understand that they may have a traumatic response to that trafficking is so important. Um, because they may not even realize that what's happening to them is actually because they're having a traumatic response. Um, also, another another key point of a trauma-informed approach is that you are con you can connect potential victims to crucial support networks to foster supportive interpersonal relationships and growth, including connecting the victim to local survivor networks. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how organizations should treat peers in a second, but I think it is also um, very, very valuable to connect victims with peers in one form or another. Um, will it always go smoothly? No. No, it's not going to. I run support groups, virtual support groups for survivors of trauma right now, and I can tell you that people trigger each other. Um, it happens, but having the ability to connect with people who actually know what they've been through on a very deep personal level is so critical to that survivor's sort of acceptance and um, being able to sort of drop the shame they may be carrying around what happened to them. Um, <clears throat> another thing a trauma-informed approach does for us is it helps people with histories of trauma to manage feelings, feel in control of situations, and give input on the programs and services they want to be a part of. This gets back to this idea of autonomy, um, but it's also important for trauma survivors to understand that many times they're having a trauma response to something that's happening around them, um, and it makes them feel out of control. And so a part of learning how to address their own traumatic responses is to recognize that's what's happening so that they can begin to address things from a perspective of being an empowered, autonomous adult or older child, if that's what they happen to be. These can be very, you know, that can be a very powerful learning for a, a trafficking victim. Um, Another, another thing that trauma-informed approaches do for us is it changes the paradigm from what is wrong with you to one that asks, what has happened to you? And I can't stress the difference in that um, more. I, I, could, I could spend an hour talking about just that and how critically important it is for survivors of trafficking and trauma to understand that their response to life right now is not something that's wrong with them, um, but it's how they have responded to what has happened to them. Um, and then uh, the last one I want to bring up here around the trauma-informed approach is that it engages people with histories of trauma in a manner that recognizes the experience of trauma and acknowledges the impact of trauma on development and coping strategies. Because the impact of trauma is incredibly holistic. Studies are showing the inextricable tie between physical difficulties and traumatic experiences. Um, and this is especially true when the trauma has been prolonged. And that is the case with most trafficking victims. They've been through prolonged trauma. Sometimes we refer to it as complex trauma. Um, and that is what they're experiencing. So if we can help them to understand how that trauma is potentially impacting all aspects of their life and not just maybe their therapeutic life, uh, that can be incredibly helpful for them in their own healing. I know that's something I focus with a lot with my clients and in my virtual groups is how is your entire life being impacted by your traumatic experience? Because if they can understand that, then they can also begin to make changes to that. And they can feel empowered to make changes to that. Because it's not just that they're having a random response to a random event, but that it is actually a holistic response to trauma. Um, the ACE studies help a lot with this, actually, because they're showing these connections that we've never really known were there before. So another reason to go and do some uh, research on the ACE site as well. Um, and then just 
to kind of take a, a little bit of a side note, when organizations are working with peers and bringing those peers in to support potential victims, there's a few things that are really important to consider. And this, of course, is very near and dear to my heart because I do work with organizations as a peer and a coach and a mentor of uh, trafficking victims and other trauma survivors. And so I've seen some of these things play out directly. And, and we need to make sure that we're engaging peers with empathy, respect, and support. Um, so we, we want to be coming at this by um, really treating these peers with as much respect as we can. Um, we need to provide meaningful opportunities for peers to facilitate, organize, and coordinate activities. So it isn't that the peer is sitting there while somebody else is sort of doing all of the work, but that we're very engaged with these peers and allowing them to be a part of the process. Um, and we want to offer peers choices and honor their decisions, just like we would with somebody who's coming directly out of a human trafficking situation. Um, we want to be treating those peers similarly. And, and this is, goes back to the point I made earlier, too, which is this is the way we want to treat staff. We want to treat everybody in our organization like this, um, and not just people who are coming right out of a traumatic situation. Um, and the last thing I want to say on this slide, I know I'm talking a lot on this slide, but it's important, is to do your research on what works and what is available for trauma victims in your area. Talk to survivors about what works for them. Because just because somebody or something is claiming to be trauma-informed doesn't mean it's survivor-informed. And it may not be avoiding re-traumatization, because there have been some trauma-informed approaches out there that when I looked into them further, they weren't really promoting the autonomy and the healing that is really needed after um, complex trauma. So do your research and involve survivors in your discussion on what really works for trauma. Um, so thank you for listening. So before we get to the video, I just uh, wanted to mention quickly a little bit about my story. Now, my story and the story that you're about to hear are actually n not that different. And interestingly enough, we are quite, like, there's, this is actually not a normal story that you hear in the media or in the news at all. And so you're kind of going to get two perspectives that you might not hear a lot of. but. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my story. You know that I am a family-controlled um, survivor of sex trafficking. Um, and when I was growing up, yes, my parents were my primary traffickers. I went to many medical doctors, and my parents would go with me and make excuses for what was happening to me. I had a ton of UTIs as a toddler, for example, and it was suggested by my mother that they were caused by bedwetting. And the nurses who were um, working at the doctor's offices would believe her. Um, now, I know that in many cases that wouldn't happen today, but my mother's an extremely convincing person, so I think it's an important point to make. Um, my parents would not allow any pelvic exams or anything that might show that I had been through any type of sexual abuse. Um, but when I was eight, I was taken to a doctor by a neighbor where, when my parents were out of town, and the doctor did a pelvic exam and called the police. Um, and while that sounds like a really good thing, what actually happened next was actually added to my traumatic experiences. Um, basically, everybody was standing in a room. They were all very concerned. They were all adults. I was the only child in the room. And what I gathered, because I was a child at the time, was that everybody in the room was mad at me. Because I had been living in such a punitive household, that was what came across. And so, I was immediately taken into um, foster care because of this experience. Um, and in foster care, I was, I was placed in a very neglectful um, foster care, which was more like a hotel for kids. They didn't make meals for us. We were on, basically on our own. And I ended up being raped by a foster care brother. So in the process, I decided the best choice was for me to go home. 
I changed my story and I said everything at home is fine um, and that basically what the result of that was is that my CPS workers were very disappointed in me. Once again, I interpreted their reaction as being angry with me and I had a judge who actually slut shamed me because he decided the reason for my physical injuries was because I had decided I wanted to. Now remember, I was eight to nine years old at the time that this happened. So I think what, and, and unfortunately, I think what happened for a lot of survivors in, in family-controlled situations is that the experiences we have with adults outside of our family can be um, scary and we don't necessarily trust them because we've been told not to and then we can get into situations where we feel like our parents are right all along because the experiences don't turn out to be good for us. So I'm going to turn it over now to the video where a good survivor friend of mine is going to tell her story. I was trafficked beginning as a very young child. Uh, it was pretty much almost a part of my life, um, all of my life, up until I escaped when I was 18. My trafficker was somebody that had my complete trust and the complete trust of my family, and therefore it made it very easy to gain access to me, to exploit me. There were quite a few moments in time when I was trafficked that, you know, the opportunity for intervention arose. When I was a young child, I had chronic reoccurring vaginal infections that was treated my, by my pediatrician. Then in middle school, um, I contracted a oral sexually transmitted disease um, in which I was treated by an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Both physicians were wonderful and very caring, um, but not one physician or healthcare worker ever asked whether I was being sexually exploited, not once. Both doctors knew my family, and so I think that they may have dismissed that, thinking no way could a child from a middle-class home be being exploited. Another case where I see an opportunity that was missed for an intervention was um, I was in middle school. Somebody reported that I was being sexually abused I had to go down to Child Protective Services. Prior to going to my interview, I was coached by my trafficker on what to say and how to deny the abuse. He told me not to talk too much and to know that the CPS was not my friend. I distinctively remember him saying, do you know what they want to do? And I said, no and he said that they want to take you away if you say anything for good. You'll be locked up, taken away from your family, your friends, and your pets. You will go to jail, and everybody will know what you did. By the time I got there and walking into the office in which I was interviewed by a CPS worker, I walked in there feeling guilty feeling ashamed and not at all seeing the social worker who was interviewing me as somebody that could help me, who was there to rescue me and bring me to safety. I saw her as the enemy and I answered her questions denying that I was being abused and left there um, with no, there was no follow up and I left and my con trafficking continued. All right. So what we're going to do now is, is just talk about a couple of questions here. What I'd like for everyone to do is um, come back to your chat box and answer a, a few questions we have here. The first one, when it comes to the story you saw in the video, what red flags should the providers have seen?
vaginal infections as a toddler, oral STI, frequent vaginal infections, yes. No child should have STDs. Physical symptoms, fearfulness and timidness, yes, absolutely. Thank you guys for responding to that. What questions could the providers or the social workers have asked? How are things at home? Open-ended questions, absolutely. Do you feel safe? And the next one says, ask if comfortable. What is happening to you? Are you safe? Do you know that we are here to help? Yes. Yes, and, and, and then this next question is, I think, a really important one, is about do you know what my role is? Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's a real critical question because um, people may have told her, told her, or people did tell her to be, to, to believe that the role of this person was to cause her harm and, and difficulties in her life by arresting her and whatnot. Yes, do you know what the, my role is? Um, you know, I'm seeing also, are you afraid of anyone? Tell me what it's like, what a day in your house is like. Um, these are all really good questions. And they're scrolling by so fast, I can't even get to all of them here. Um, and, you know, assure her that you are there to help. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, so the next question for you guys is, what should the social worker have done differently here? Explain their role, yes. I think that's one of the most critical things. Followed up, the other very critical thing here, um, you know, really helping the, the, the child to understand the role of the social worker and that they're not there to retaliate or um, arrest the child. And then also, yes, the, the following up, um, you know, not allowing this to be a one-contact situation, I think is critically important. Um, and someone's saying, give her a phone number and tell her that she can call at any time. Yes. Um, you know, this gets back to that whole building a longer-term relationship um, with the child can be very helpful. Yes. Gaining her trust, which takes, of course, time, as we were saying. <clears throat> Asking some open-ended questions. Yes. All right. Thank you guys so much for these really awesome answers. This is exactly the discussion we need to have. Um, another person said visit her home. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really good one. And, and it's also important to note that in some cases where there is sexual abuse that leaves trafficking in the home, visiting the home won't give you any obvious indicators. Um, it won't look like you might think it's going to look like. I know my parents were absolutely famous for the, the what I call their perfection mask, which is everything in the home looked perfect and great and beautiful, and you would have never known anything was wrong walking in that house, ever. But I do think it's critically important that um, CPS workers go there, go to the home, because that may or may not be the case. So, all right. Thanks for all your answers. And you're welcome, Beth. I'm, gl I'm glad I could share this story. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about trust building, um, because if there's anything that's the hardest thing to do, it's probably this. Yes? So, you know, it's one of the most important points about trust is that it will take a long time to build it. And it will come in stages. You can lose trust at any time for any reason. Remember, the victim expects you to betray them. They are waiting for it, OK? So that's why it's so critical that you don't. And that's sort of when I mentioned earlier this idea of 
little white lies, you know, don't tell them, not even the littlest ones that may seem like you're protecting them, um, because they are just looking for you to do something to hurt them, because that's what they've experienced probably over and over and over again, okay? So we have to go into the relationship understanding that. Um, and, you know, we need to see the potential victim as an individual and treat him or her with dignity and respect. And this comes to a point that I think is critical to make here, which is you are not a savior and they are not your problem to solve. Um, you know, I know as social workers, I have my MSW uh, and I am also a survivor and a life coach, but I can tell you that it is really easy to fall into the trap of wanting to save this person and that is not where we want to go. We need to treat them with dignity and respect. We need to treat them as an equal to us and they need to be able to feel that. Um, they need to feel that we respect them um, and not be thinking, oh, I'm just somebody this person is trying to trying to save here today. Um, foster honesty, trust, and respect with a suspected victim, definitely. Understand that incremental disclosure is how most cases unfold. Okay, let me give you guys maybe a little more information than you wanted right here. But not only does the narrative change as victims heal, but memories may actually be repressed in addition to that. So not only are we dealing with a situation where the person will over time begin to translate that memory differently, like when they first say it, they may not consider it rape, but later on in the story, later on as they begin to heal and they begin to see the trafficker for who they really are, the words might change and suddenly it becomes rape instead of sex. Um, these are very typical sort of interpretations of their story that shift over time. But in addition to that, you may also be dealing with the fact that memories of traumatic situations just don't show up at first. Um, and they may never show up, but in a lot of instances, they come later on in the process. And so we do have to make sure we understand that incremental disclosure is something that happens. There will also be instances where they'll tell you a part of the story because they want to see if you're going to freak out on them or not or if you're going to be trustworthy, and then they'll tell you the rest of the story later when they feel better about trusting you. That absolutely happens too. There's a combination of things that are going on here that contribute to incremental disclosure. And it's very important that as social workers, and you know, we understand this, I talk an awful lot with um, law enforcement about this and try to encourage them to understand how disclosure actually works and why a, a potential victim of human trafficking will disclose incrementally because there really is a lot going on when there's been trauma in this way. Um, it's very important that we change our understanding of how that narrative is coming forward for us. The next one, use open-ended questions. Because one of the things I know that I did for many years was I always looked to give the right answer. And I did this in school, too, which is one of the reasons I got such great grades. But in reality, I was always looking to see what does the person want me to say here? Because I wanted their approval and I wanted them to like me, and I wanted all of these things. And I also just sort of wanted them to not get mad at me, right? I mean, I'd been in all of these situations that were violent and, you know, um, uh, critical all of my life. And so I certainly didn't want to give anybody an answer they didn't like. And so we have to keep our questions as open-ended as possible because that eliminates the possibility hopefully eliminates the possibility that they're just telling you what you want to hear. doesn't eliminate it fully. I understand that. They can still find a way to try to tell you what you need. <clears throat> so, but I think we have to keep that in mind. And then also re practice reflective listening. Um, so many times survivors are not used to being heard. Victims are definitely not used to being heard. And so if you can point out that you are listening, are. That, that's critical. Um, so, I just wanted to bring up a, a couple more points on this. When asked what might have made a difference in telling the truth about what has happened to them, many victims said that an indication that the provider cared 
or saw him or her as an individual and treated him or her with dignity and respect would have made a difference. Victims said that finding a way to connect with them um, was so important. Asking them personal questions, showing concern for them as a whole person, not just maybe the medical condition they have on that day, um, is, is important to be doing. You know, and, and you can build rapport. You know, some sample questions might be, you know, where is your home? Are you in school? Are you working? Is work okay? You know, beginning to build that type of um, uh, conversation, I think, really makes a difference. It can start the process of creating trust between you and the victim. Um, and so it, it's something to do. I'll, I'll read this. Um, there's this piece that came out specifically from a healthcare provider. And I think that it's worth noting what she had to say here. <clears throat> When I first see a patient or a client, I let him or her talk about whatever he or she wants to discuss. I don't force a series of questions or ask from a list. I engage the patients or clients and just let them tell me why they are in my office. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is acting funny. Part of this process is patience. Incremental disclosure is a huge part of the way these cases unfold more so than with any other kind of trauma. The potential victim may tell you one story on week one and another week two and still another week three, but listening is important because this is how you will start bonding with these patients or clients. Often they have bonded with their trafficker because of a set of complex emotional reasons, circumstances in their past, such as adverse childhood events, repeated exposure to physical abuse and trauma. This bonding must be broken and new bonds formed. The potential victim is asking herself, how do I survive now that I don't have him around me? And the setting has to be safe, secure, and the trust must develop in order for the potential victim to tell what has really happened to them. So, let's move on to the next slide here. <clears throat> OK. Cultivating trust and creating a safe space. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, the first one here is conducting the interview in a safe and comfortable environment. Privacy, okay? This is hard stuff to talk about. And we want to make sure that they feel that when they're talking to you, they're not also being overheard or listened to by other people. Um, and really looking at, is this a trauma-informed space? For example, can they see the door? Still to this day, when I sit in a restaurant, I have to sit in a way that I can see the door, okay? So certainly when somebody is just coming out of a victim of, or just coming from being potentially a victim of something this trauma traumatizing, um, they are going to need to feel that they're safe in the space. And one of those ways is can they see the door? Are there triggering items in the room? You can even ask them, is there anything in the room that feels like a distraction to you or is triggering something from your past or your traumatic experiences? Um, remove the item. Um, but if you don't ask, they may just sit there and fixate on it and not tell you about it. Um, I know that when I first started going to therapy, that was certainly my approach. Um, so trust is compromised when an interviewer appears judgmental, OK? Um, it's really important. You know, it isn't your place to have an opinion about what happened to them. And I know you know that, but it's really easy when you get in situations, especially when they're sharing something that's very difficult to listen to, to want to have an opinion. Um, the next one, press is too hard for disclosure. This is re-traumatizing. And I know that this is a common experience in law enforcement, and they need to know that in other settings, they are not going to also be experiencing that. I mean, I've worked with clients who have experienced family abuse and trafficking now for many, many years, and they may have been working on their own recovery from trauma for 20 years or so, and they still haven't disclosed to anybody beyond the therapeutic community, and that's their right. Um, and so I, we have to respect that. Um, the next one, fails to promote informed consent. Once again, coming back to this idea of autonomy and choice, it needs to be their choice. Um, 
and they meeting infrequently with a potential victim. Okay, now I, I'm going to change this a little bit to making yourself available to meet infrequently because let's face it, potential victims can sometimes have a little bit of trouble convincing themselves to meet with you or, um, you know, maybe facing their own defenses against meeting with you. There may be other barriers in place, but stay as flexible as you can when it comes to meeting with potential victims because if you're available, even if they can't make it, they will take note of that. They will take note that you made yourself available. Um, so trust is promoted when an interviewer clarifies his or her role in supporting the potential victim. And that was something that a lot of people brought up when we were talking about the earlier case um, that, you know, for example, I'm not a cop and what you tell me is confidential unless I feel you are in immediate danger. It's great information to provide. Also, you know, especially if you're dealing with children, a little bit more about the details of, of who you are and why you're not a threat is, I think, really important. Also, Define what he or she can do for the potential victims without making unrealistic promises. Um, definitely, they need to know how, how are you going to help them. Um, ask simple questions, listens to the potential victim's answers, and emphasizes what he or she is not guilty or, or that he or she is not guilty or at fault. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. Um, and then finally, demonstrates cultural competency, okay? So I wanted to add to this section that there are three really important phrases in relationship building with survivors of trauma. Um, the first one is, and, and maybe none of these will surprise you very much, but the first one is, it's not your fault, right? That's such a critically important phrase. We don't want to be judging them. Um, we also want to be helping them to see where they may be blaming themselves, um, but it isn't, it isn't their fault, okay? The next phrase is, I believe you, okay? Their story is going to change. Keep believing their story. Um, and be careful not to use well-meaning phrases like, oh, you don't seem like you went through all of that. Because I heard that many times in the therapeutic community, and while it, I, I, I got that it was meant to be a compliment and that they were saying, oh, look how strong you are, you went through all of this, and, and you don't seem like you went through any of it, but what that, that sort of indicates is a slight bit of invalidation of what they went through. It's like, oh, you don't believe me because I don't look like I went through that. So stay, stay away from well-meaning phrases like that, even though I know they sound good. And then the last phrase that's so important in relationship building is something I refer to as me too, okay? Share a bit about who you are when it is appropriate. If you can relate and you can, and you can go there and go there in a professional sense, let them know it. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that you should say that something happened to you that didn't happen to you, not at all. But if you can relate to their pain, if you can relate to some level of their experiences, let them know. This is another reason why peer relationships are so critical, because there is so much healing in being able to hear from others that they understand, that they experience it themselves even. So, next slide. All right, so we're going to talk uh, for the next couple of slides a little bit more about the procedural side of things. And so we're going to start off with, the sep with separating the patient or the client from a possible controller. It is critical for every provider to have a separation protocol. This plan must be established ahead of time. A separation plan allows the provider to examine or question the patient or client privately in a safe environment. The plan needs to cover who will carry out the actual separation process and what will occur if the person accompanying the patient refuses to leave their side. <clears throat> Strict criteria should be set for when and when not to intervene once a patient or client has been identified. If a decision is made to proceed with an intervention, a clear procedure must be determined in advance. That includes notification of internal and external security officials. Informed consent will need to be obtained from a potential adult victim and local child protective services will need to be contacted for a minor. Remember that the victims may not understand the term human trafficking and may be reluctant to leave their trafficker at this time. 
human trafficking is a criminal activity. That means that the traffickers may be armed and violent. <clears throat> this means, <clears throat> excuse me, this means that there is inherent danger involved with any type of intervention. Most of the danger centers on the patient who has now been identified as a potential victim of human trafficking. If an intervention is planned and failed, a victim may suffer additional abuse and trauma from his or her trafficker. In addition, the staff of your agency may be exposed to some level of danger, so it is critical to work through the safety component of any intervention before it is carried out using input from local and federal law enforcement and hospital security, if that's applicable. And it's also important to note here that if you're already working within the domestic violence community, you may already have a good idea of what this looks like. Um, but it's critical that you make sure that if you do have a protocol in place already for domestic violence situations, that you update that so that it includes what to do when you're faced with human trafficking. <clears throat> so if you could now go to the chat box one more time and share any experiences you have had with separating potential trafficking victims. I see that we have multiple attendees typing. We have one nun. Worked in a medical clinic where clinic protocol was to room patient alone before allowing anyone in room with him or her. Yes, it's a great example. If someone comes to our office with a client, I explain that it's our policy to meet with everyone alone, and they're happy to wait in the front waiting area. Yes, another great example. Very challenging even when separated, especially when the situation has been long-term and there's pregnancy and young children involved. Absolutely. Separation is a step, but let's be honest. Separation doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly we're going to have this beautiful, glorious relationship set up with this um, trafficking victim and everything's going to be great. Um, it really, it, it's a step in the process, but yet nothing is assured just because of this step. I see that there are several other people typing. Let me give just another minute here. Okay. Had DV cards with phone numbers made small so it could fit in the shoe. That's a great one. And there, there are some really good tactics also out there for how to give contact information to uh, victims so that they can um, they can contact you later when they are in a place where they're not with their trafficker. So absolutely, that's an, another technique. <clears throat> Ask Perk to speak with insurance person regarding billing matter. Great one. Thank you, guys. All right, thanks so much for those answers. And we are, by the way, going to talk a little bit more about the separation process in the final section, too. So. Um, Let's talk about um, a particular tool for action. And we're going to start off by focusing on safety. It's necessary to ask trafficking-specific questions if red flags are raised. However, first you need to make sure that it is safe to conduct an assessment. And, and of course, we've already discussed one aspect of the safety, which is the separation. When you're conducting a safety check in person, you need to ask the following questions. Is it safe for you to talk with me right now? Do you feel like you are in any kind of danger while speaking with me at this location? Um, is there anything that would help you to feel safer while we talk? Those are some really good examples of things that you could ask <clears throat> just to assess whether or not it's safe to continue. Um, when you're conducting a safety check-in by phone, remind that individual that he or she is free to hang up at any point during the conversation. 
if he or she believes that someone may be listening in. Then ask the following questions. How can we communicate if we get disconnected? Would I be able to call you back or leave a message? If someone comes on the line, what would you like for me to do? Hang up? Identify myself as someone else, a certain person or friend? Are you in a safe place? Can you tell me where you are? Would you prefer to call me back when you are in a safe place? And then, are you injured? Would you like me to call 911 or an ambulance? So these are some examples of questions you can ask that can help you determine if it is safe to continue with an, ass with an assessment. And so now we're going to discuss one example of an assessment tool. It's called the Trafficking Victim Identification Tool. And it can help you in the actual process of identifying um, trafficking victims. Um, <clears throat> the Vera Institute of Justice recently completed studies in which they created, field tested, and validated the first screening tool that can reliably identify both adult and minor victims of sex and labor trafficking, including both US and foreign born victims. The tool was validated in victim service agencies um, and not in healthcare settings. So depending on what your environment is, it may or may not have been validated in that environment. However, in the work that I've, um, you know, the people that I've discussed about, you know, this particular tool with, what I've found is they've been able to take pieces and parts of this tool and incorporate it into their existing assessment tools, especially in the case of medical communities, um, in order to um, really gain uh, gain a more integrated process to identifying human trafficking. So the questions color, cover the, the following topics. Personal background and demographics, migration in the United States, and work and living conditions. Okay. So this is something for you to look into. And by the way, the Trafficking Victim Identification Tool is something that's available for free, and I see that the link has just been put in the chat, so you can go and grab that. So to wrap up, we're going to do um, uh, or ask a couple of questions that are what would you do, and I would love to see you guys um, answer in the chat here. We're, we're probably going to not focus on the last question because we sort of already talked about that a little bit, but what would you do if you see that the patient or client has bruises on her face and arms and an unusual tattoo or brand at the top of her breast? Ask open-ended questions, definitely. Don't ignore it. Ask her what happened or the meaning behind the tattoo. Find a way to speak to her alone. Make a general comment that the bruises look painful and ask if she's open to talking about them. That's a good one there, too. Seek to build trust and rapport that we are providers who can assist her. How did you get those bruises? What is the significant of, significance of your tattoo? <clears throat> Would you like to tell me something? Yes. Yes. So there's some really great responses. It's obvious you guys have been paying attention. Thank you for those great answers. Um, so next. What would you do? What would you do or ask next? So let's say you've asked these questions. They've given you some answers, and maybe they sound a little suspicious. What would you do or ask next? Do you want help? <clears throat> ask if she has a safe place um, to stay or who she turns to for support. Try to get her to talk about it. 
If not, offer a phone number and explain your role and let her know that she can call you. Yes. Is someone hurting you? I am concerned. Can I tell you more about possible things we can do to help you? That's great. These are good. Thank you, guys. So, and the final question um, is, what would you do if she tries to leave the room in the middle of a meeting? Offer to meet with her again. Yes. Try to give her a card as she is, was walking out. Um, tell her she is always welcome back, yes. Yeah, that's so important for everybody, you know, to really focus in on is, is, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to get a disclosure the first time you meet a human trafficking victim. But if they feel like you are open to them reaching out to you at other times, that may be a way to get them at least thinking about the possibility that they can get help. So always remember I am here. Yes, I love that. Um, Okay, thank you guys so much. So to wrap up the ask section summary here, what we have learned today is about applying trauma-informed techniques and how that can improve your ability to work with a potential victim of human trafficking. Um, building trust is essential when working with potential victims. I think I probably over talked about that particular topic because it's so critically important. Um, next, conduct a safety check with a patient prior to starting the interview. And then that you do have the uh, opportunity and ability to use the Trafficking Victim Identification Tool, otherwise known as TVIT by Vera, um, to assist with interviewing. So, and I think that sums up the ask section. And, you know, if you had any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. And if we don't address them now, we can address them later. And I think we're going to be going into a break now. That's right. We have one, one final five-minute break. So let's go ahead and take that now. We'll be back here to begin the last section of the training at uh, 3.28 Eastern Time. So a five-minute break. We'll be back at 3.28. And please do feel free to go ahead and continue typing in any questions you have. We'll be sure that we address them before we wrap up the training today. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, welcome back uh, from the break. Here we are with Catherine one more time to deliver the response section of our training. Catherine, over to you. Great, thanks. Aloha, everybody. Thanks for sticking with. Okay, so the respond objectives of our training include um, referring a potential victim based on available local resources and your profession, apply culturally and linguistically appropriate services, standards, and exhibit cultural awareness when interacting with potential victims of human trafficking, define the role that governmental and non-governmental organizations play in addressing the issue of human trafficking, uh, apply SOAR to a real-world case study, communicate the basic elements necessary for a human trafficking response protocol, and communicate the qualities of an advocate for human trafficking awareness who can work effectively with management and peers. Now, Use your referral networks to help human trafficking victims get the help they need because you can't do this alone. No one agency can. Uh, decide where to refer a potential victim. It should be based on agreement and discussions between you and the potential victim, always. Uh, some things to keep in mind are food, clothing, your basic needs, interpretation if needed, clean interpretation, as I mentioned before, that can be problematic, uh, immigration, civil legal assistance, to stave off deportation fears. Uh, identify local service providers that can help you with that. Um, uh, dental substance abuse treatment needs, behavioral health treatment referrals, identify those service providers. Uh, anonymous reports, if any, can be made to the NTRC, NHTRC, the Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, it is also important to connect the potential victim to support systems for survivors to ensure that you are providing holistic care so like what I said before is uh, the response to these survivors really require a holistic approach. Um, not just one agency can fill the need. Um, human trafficking is a crime, and if you believe a crime has been com committed, contact law enforcement after you get the trust and the consent of your client. Never before. Because as Elizabeth said, it can be very re-traumatizing once law enforcement comes in because they don't have these kinds of sensitivity trainings at all. They're not required to. Um, if a potential victim is a minor, follow your agency reporting protocols, which I believe most of us are, in fact, all of us are mandatory reporters in that area. Um, if you do choose to report this crime, please work with your local anti-trafficking network and diversify it. Don't just go to one. Go to multiple, um, because you never know the level of training anybody at that one agency has. Um, this is a, an evolving process, and it will continue to evolve, so never take for granted that one agency or one person is the go-to for all trafficking cases. Uh, peer support is absolutely critical. If possible, engage local survivor networks. Survivor networks are absolutely beneficial to the healing process. Um, identify other networks that the potential victim um, survivor identifies as safe places, like houses of worship, a hobby, uh, volunteering for a cause, reunification with loved ones that are safe, support groups of other sorts, and athletic at activities. Um, also, alternative forms of care and healing, like acupuncture or massages or you know, uh, yoga, are, can also be very helpful outside of our budget plan, but <laughs> nevertheless effective. We can uh, draw on lessons learned and tools from public health responses to intimate partner violence or sexual abuse, which have already come under the remit of public health. State or national referral mechanisms can ensure that providers can participate in a network of well-prepared and trustworthy services, for example, shelters, legal aid, law enforcement, social work. Medical and health education that recognizes human trafficking as a health concern is a fundamental con component of a public health strategy. Uh, paraprofessional community health workers can assist in the identification and support of trafficking victims because of their presence in vulnerable communities. Community health workers are typically trusted and respected community leaders, making it easier to offer more effective and culturally sensitive education and interventions that result in better outcomes. So for those of you who have um, populations of natives, uh, really you know, utilize those uh, native-centered NGOs 
um, that can really help open the dialogue uh, and, and establish trust and, and network with them to be able to become more culturally sensitive, uh, use them. They, they definitely know that human trafficking is a very big problem in the indigenous community and want some help in, do, in combating it. So uh, I always underscore the relevance of the native population and really um, urge everybody, if you have a native population in your area, to reach out to those elders and those groups that are already doing this work. As we have seen, healthcare professionals play a major role in identifying a potential victim of human trafficking. However, utilizing the larger referral network is necessary to provide the services needed to protect holistically the potential victim, help them recover, and prevent further trafficking and recidivism. If you think you have encountered a victim of trafficking, it is important to collaborate among these key service providers, including law enforcement, social service providers, and others mentioned on this slide. This helps to ensure that the survivors receive the help and services that they need. Local law enforcement and social service providers can also supply valuable information about the types of trafficking occurring in your area. This may help when compiling a list of red flags and indicators specific to your local population. For example, local vice officers may be aware of common street names and tattoos used by traffickers working in your area and the specific types of trafficking present. Reporting requirements. Do you know what your state report, reporting requirements are? Uh, states vary uh, um, frequently, as does the definition of trafficking. So know your laws, know your mandatory reporting requirements, know what they dictate. The patient or client must be reported, if that is the case. Mandatory reporting requirements um, can get a little uh, compl complex uh, uh, in tribal law jurisdictions. So it's important to know the requirements in those areas and continue to work with the Health, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, the HIPAA guidelines. Um, state laws on suspected child abuse, domestic violence, and vulnerable populations abuse may apply, even if you're not sure that this is a trafficking case. You cannot physically restrain a child or prevent him or her from leaving. You should offer both the child and adult referrals, hotline numbers, etc. but make sure that giving written materials does not jeopardize the potential victim's safety. Also, let the potential victim know that if he or she chooses to come back, you and your organization would like to see him or her and can offer services. If possible, try to schedule a follow-up visit. And while it's crucial to document the patient's injuries and treatments well, sometimes this information can be used against the victim of trafficking in court proceedings. Uh, there should be guidelines in place for what and how best to document. Um, so you should be very concerned about developing protocol um, and downloading assessment tools. And I'd like to remind you that if you didn't see it already, uh, there are assessment tools and uh, protocols available to download in the files to download pod on your screen. In addition to the following, uh, to following the state reporting requirements, make sure the organize, organization are meeting, organizations are meeting the class standards so victims receive culturally competent care. The enhanced national class standards are intended to advance health equity, improve quality, and help eliminate healthcare disparities by establishing a blueprint for individuals as well as health and healthcare organizations to implement culturally and linguistically appropriate services. The enhanced standards are a comprehensive series of guidelines that inform, guide, and facilitate practices related to culturally and linguistically appropriate health services. We refer to the three handouts for further information. Although the Class standards are designed for healthcare settings. They can and should be applied to social service settings as well. So offer language assistance to individuals who have limited English proficiency or other communication needs at no cost to them to facilitate timely access to all healthcare and services. Ensure the competence of individuals providing language assistance, recognizing that the use of untrained individuals or minors as interpreters should be avoided. 
provide easy to understand print and multimedia materials and signage in the languages commonly used by the population in the service area. So the National Human Trafficking Hotline, NHTH, is a national anti-trafficking resource center with a hotline, a 24-hour one, serving potential victims of human trafficking and the anti-trafficking community across the nation. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Um, this resource is a nonprofit, non-governmental organization funded by the federal government that works exclusively to combat all forms of human trafficking. It is not a law enforcement or immigration authority. The mission of NHTH is to provide trafficking victims and survivors with access to critical support and services to get help and stay safe and to equip the anti-trafficking community with tools to effectively combat human trafficking. The NHTH offers confidential round-the-clock access to a safe space to report tips, seek services, and ask for help. With an extensive service referral directory of over 3,000 local service providers across the country, the NHTH is able to provide localized information and referrals. The NHTH also maintains case records to provide continuous care when callers move or need ongoing assistance over time. Anyone can call the hotline at any time, be it a provider or a patient or client. Service providers need not break confidentiality or HIPAA guidelines to access services to the hotline. I'll repeat that again. Service providers need not break confidentiality or HIPAA guidelines to access the service. The minimum information that a healthcare or social service provider should have when calling the hotline includes one, age of patient or client, two, any physical or emotional injuries noted and documented, three, details regarding the patient or client's work or living situation. Moving right along. Okay, so we're going into a final group exercise. Now read through the case study provided um, and work on your own to develop a response using the four areas that we covered, we've covered in the training. Stop. What common risk factors for human trafficking does this individual exhibit, observe? What are the physical and mental indicators of human trafficking in this scenario? Ask how would you apply victim-centered services, or sorry, interview techniques to this case. Respond. To what service providers would you refer a potential victim of human trafficking? Okay, this is Leilani again. So we're going to read one more case study. This one is about Barbara, and it's listed in the file to download if you'd like to follow along as I read. And then just to reiterate uh, what Catherine just said, if you could be thinking about um, how you would respond to this person, to Barbara, if, if you were part of this case study as I read, um, then we'll ask you to, to answer the questions that Catherine just read off for us. Okay, so Barbara case study, it reads, I grew up in a suburb in Northern Virginia. I was molested in my home for the first time by my father when I was eight years old. I started running away from home to get away from the abuse. The first time was when I was 12 years old. The police were always catching me and bringing me back, and my parents didn't seem to know what to do with me. I spent time in a detention center, in reform schools, and in hospital centers for children with problems. My mother was in complete denial. I tried to tell her once what was happening, but she couldn't believe me or she didn't want to. They put me into the juvenile justice system and into the child welfare system, and eventually my parents' rights to me were taken away. I kept running away to Washington, D.C., and before long, people noticed me there. One day, a woman picked me up when I was around 13 years old. She took me back to her apartment and told me I could stay there with her. While there, she began to groom me for prostitution. She told me the man in her apartment was her boyfriend, but now I believe he was a trafficker. One day, when I was 13 or 14, they sold me to another pimp named Moses. He was vicious but smart and had many women under his control. He sold me to anyone and everyone. He had a quota which was hard to make, and if I didn't make it, he would take out a wire coat hanger and whip me mercilessly. I did whatever he wanted me to do for fear he would beat me again. I walked the tracks around certain hotels, and I was arrested many times, but my pimp never bailed me out. He didn't want to spend the money, so I would just sit in jail until they finally let me out. Around that time, I started using drugs that were given to me. At first, I used them to numb the pain, but I quickly became addicted to heroin. With all the beatings, violence, and abuse, I became tough, 
but somewhere inside me, I was able to protect, to protect a small little place, a place that loves life, loves animals, and years later when I was helped to leave the life, I told someone what happened to me, and she couldn't believe it. She kept saying, you don't seem like all that happened to you. The emergency department was my doctor during the years I was on the street. Even though I was obviously a minor during the first years, no one asked me what had happened to me or what was wrong. Ultimately, one caring and concerned person in the drug rehab center where I went for methadone saw I was sick and addicted and realized there was something more going on. She saw I needed help, and she took the time to ask some questions and get me to tell my story. She was the one who found me the right set of services for what had happened to me, but it wasn't until years later that I really understood that I was a trafficking victim. Okay, so I think um, if I okay, could just so respond. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Catherine. That's okay. So if this was your client, everybody, uh, what would you do? Uh, walk through the store, uh, the source steps. And we, uh, I think we should keep it on this slide. Again, what common mm -hmm. risk factors uh, of human trafficking does this individual exhibit? What are the physical, mental indicators? Go ahead and start responding while I'm reading this off. How would you apply victim-centered interview techniques to this case? To what service providers would you link up with to refer this potential victim of trafficking? Okay, one response we have is um, frequent runaway. A few more responses coming in. Looks like early sexual abuse by a family member, a running away without support from parents, uh, runaway history of juvenile services, early trauma. These are all good examples of common risk factors from this, this case. Uh, high engagement with the system, a high ACE score, referring back to what Elizabeth covered. Um, that was definitely an indication or a risk factor here. Um, let's see. Other responses, Catherine, are trust, vulnerability issues from childhood sex abuse, substance abuse, time in jail. Good, good uh, let's responses. Like let's, let's hear from how, how many, or how would you ask, how would you apply victim-centered interview techniques to this case? We have a few people typing in their responses. Okay. Avoid the trauma. Avoid the trauma situation. <laughs> Tell them who you are and that they can trust you, and then ask them if they're okay. Another suggestion, I'd explain my role and how I could help them. Uh, create safety and allow the victim to tell story and identify needs. Great, all great responses. I'd like to also throw out there that you never want to, I hate using that word never, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You never want to feed information to a victim, uh, depending on the age and how long they've been trafficked. They may not know the lingo associated with prostitution trafficking, um, but that actually uh, helps uh, build your character profile of this victim. You never want to teach them what these terms are. If they don't know what they are, then you know that they haven't been in their situation for very long, or it may tell you a little bit more about the trafficker that he or she is involved with. Um, so let them speak. Uh, let them throw out the terms if they know them and know what they are. Uh, don't teach them about what prostitution is, in, in other words through vernacular, okay? Great. Okay, so let's move right along. You guys are absolutely wonderful in your responses. Um, so protocol components. A protocol develop for, development for human trafficking should include these very important elements. To be able to apply for within your workplace, you'll need a protocol for working with these potential human trafficking victims. Protocols can be extremely helpful in interacting with these potential victims and can be developed by adapting and using current systems or protocols that respond to victims of domestic violence or child abuse. For example, child abuse, sex assault, substance abuse, domestic violence all you know, weave into this dynamic that creates a human trafficking environment. Uh, the components of human trafficking protocol within the healthcare system should include many of the things we have just talked about, such as a list of red flags um, based on local trends and trafficking in your area, a separation procedure, 
um, interview procedures, once the patient is separated and ready to be interviewed, the protocol should address the following items. A, who the design interviewer will be and if an interpreter is needed. B, how trauma-informed care techniques will be utilized during the interview. C, what translators will be used and how to contact them. Very important to not take that for granted. Make sure your translator is clean. We in Hawaii had such a bad problem with uh, c translators being connected to the traffickers that we actually had to get a federal agency to help us get a translator from out of state. That's how important communication is and language control is, and the traffickers know this, and they use it. D, the specific questions about uh, to be asked and the order to ask them and how to incorporate a screening tool such as the Vera tool that you have in your um, download box pod. And E, the appropriate procedure if the patient is confirmed as a victim of trafficking, which is not your job. Um, you, the onus is not on you. You're just there to identify a potential victim. A safety planning for the potential victim and medical staff needs to be considered with proposed interventions. Advanced preparation for certain scenarios should also be considered, such as what will occur if the trafficker refuses to be separated from the patient? Think about these things. How would the response be? How should you respond when you reach a level of certainty that the patient is a victim of trafficking, but this patient refuses any intervention? Mandatory reporting. What are your state and local requirements? Your referral network. It is critical to partner with local, state, and tribal law enforcement and social service providers such as shelters, NGOs, and legal service providers, just to name a few. Federal law enforcement may need to be involved along with other federal agencies depending on the case. For instance, I think I mentioned this in the chat box before, even though the federal definition of human trafficking incorporates that anything uh, given in exchange of value for the forced labor or services is defined as trafficking, so it doesn't necessarily need to be money. Many states require that there's actually a cash exchange. So that means uh, trafficking in exchange for drugs will not uh, legally fly as a technically a, a labeled human trafficking case for that particular state. However, the federal law enforcement does include that broader definition. The caveat with that is federal law enforcement usually takes between one and two years before a case goes to indictment, if at all. Uh, local law enforcement tends to be very much quicker with their response um, in various different crimes. So things to consider, laws to know, just to be well informed. Now that you have properly identified a potential victim of human trafficking, it is very important that you receive buy-in by the potential victim, trust. Once your trust has been established, you will want to pass off that trusted relationship onto the next provider, and all providers need to be on the same page. Communication between providers is really, really important, so whatever your protocol is about uh, interagency communication and confidentiality needs to be established, because when providers don't know what's going on with their shared client or former client, that can be very, very problematic. Um, why? Because these victims tend to, uh, uh, in, in a stable setting, or shall I say, in the family of a, of a trafficker, uh, miscommunication is used and manipulation of that miscommunication is used to the advantage of the person trying to survive under abuse and duress. So that's what they're used to. So they will often create opportunities for miscommunication between provider and people will get confused trying to provide holistic care. That is why we recommend that you also have a clear, up-to-date, constantly on the same page communication with the providers you refer the, the survivor to. By engaging uh, the potential victim at every step of the follow-up process for services, you will also be able to ensure the delivery um, of these services. Because sometimes other providers will drop the ball, but you need to follow up. You really do. It, it's worth it. Maintain a high level of confidentiality, confidentiality while continuing to develop their aftercare plan with the potential victim involved. They need to be okay with where they're going. 
Enabling him or her to take back control of his or her life will help him or her to feel empowered by the process and avoid abandonment or re-exploitive situations or feelings, okay? So whenever there's a potential opportunity to teach empowerment in this way, to have them regain their sense of agency and individuality, take it. Take it and encourage that. So protocol development in schools, um, information for social workers. Uh, social workers can help support protocol development in schools, um, and that's an area where um, I see it is a large room for improvement. Protocols for interacting with potential victims of human trafficking can be developed by adapting and using current systems of protocols that respond to victims of domestic violence or child abuse. Um, and social workers can play a key role in development of these protocols within this setting. Develop, adopt, implement, and enforce a culturally specific trauma-informed policy and protocol to address trafficking. Make sure all school personnel are properly trained on the protocol Make sure that they're not there to make category just judgments of who is a victim and who isn't. Uh, make certain campus security is in place and trained so that all visitors are screened. Partner with services and law enforcement uh, develop, to develop programs and roles for parents and guardians to make them a part of their children's safety. That dovetails in really well with prevention. Um, and assess the environmental structure and take every possible step to help make um, that school safe. Identifying champions for protocol development. Well, look at your own agency and develop a protocol that requires at least one person who has the authority to move this protocol process forward. Who has that authority? The steps that we have just covered are components of a basic human trafficking protocol. In order for the protocol to be successful, though, you need to find a champion within your agency who can work effectively within your senior, senior management and other levels of ma uh, management, or not even management, the people on the front line. This needs to be a person who has the authority to move the process forward within your agency in perpetuity, not just one time. In developing a protocol, consider reaching out to local stakeholders or victims advocates to assist in the development of a healthy, safe protocol. And you might also want to talk to survivors who are willing to help you develop the protocol if you have access to them. That's also really highly recommended. We did that for this SOAR training. Whether your facility is a hospital, clinic, school, or nonprofit, identifying your champion and empowering them to develop a protocol is critical to helping victims of trafficking, and your agency, for that matter. To wrap up uh, the response section, let's review key points we've covered in this section. One, strong advocacy for victims of human trafficking begins by using the SOAR steps with potential victims and encouraging comprehensive adoption of such awareness with all employees. Two, make sure you know your local referral network. Networks vary by region, and local knowledge is one of the greatest assets in quickly connecting potential victims with the help they need in the best interest of the victim, not the agency so much. I think that happens you know, by default, but really it's the victim. Uh, have horror stories about other agencies that just work in a siloed kind of behavior and to the absolute detriment of the victims that they're serving. Cases fail, uh, their cases get thrown on a court, just absolute horrible things. So really trust that network. Develop, develop the trust needed within your own environment and community to be able to work together to help these survivors. Three, non-governmental organizations, law enforcement agencies, legal service providers, and social services will work collaboratively, ideally, with healthcare professionals to best assist identified victims of trafficking. It takes a village, once again. It is important to identify both the elements needed for the development of protocols for assisting potential victims of trafficking, as well as the appropriate advocates with the authority and appropriate training, underscore, underscore, to see that protocols are developed and implemented. Uh, so to wrap up the training as a whole, let's see if we've covered all the course objectives. This training describes the reality of human trafficking in the U.S. in terms of why it is of critical concern to your work. The course objectives were describe the type of human trafficking in the United States, recognize possible indicators of trafficking, demonstrate how to identify and respond to potential trafficking victims, 
respond appropriately to human trafficking in your community, share the importance of being aware of and responding to potential human trafficking with others in your work environment and also in your greater community. Do you feel like you can do all of these? If not, or if you do feel that way, please uh, pose your statements or ask any questions. Uh, we did have one question um, that we could answer here. That how do you approach a victim who is identified but is actively denying any involvement or abuse or danger, um, even when they're alone with a provider? So I, I don't know if Catherine or Elizabeth, either one of you wanted to, to try and answer that question. Elizabeth, you want to try and give it a shot? Yeah, um, this, this question is probably one of the most common and one of the most complicated questions when it comes to human trafficking and working with uh, victims of, of trafficking. You know, especially when you are working with um, youth, and, and I noticed that the word youth is, is a part of the question as well, there can be so many different things going on here. Of course, there can be the intimidation that we've talked about. There can be threats. There can be all sorts of different forms of coercion um, that are, you know, terrifying this person in, in not wanting, not allowing them to speak up. In my situation, when I was growing up, I actually dissociated and repressed the majority of the memories of my trauma. And I think that it's fair to assume in the case of youth, in many cases, they don't even consciously remember the worst of their trauma. Um, it has been dissociated away. And so I think the best places for youth to get an understanding for what's happening to them would be in long-term, trustworthy, respectful relationships where they can, over time, learn that they're in a safe place so that they can not only begin communicating with you about what happened to them, but they can start to sort of come to understand their own truth as well because that's a serious issue that doesn't get a lot of airtime is what if they're, they, they're not consciously lying to you? They really don't even remember the experiences they're having. Um, so I would say in, in this case with this victim, this is about building a long-term relationship with them, a safe, respectful relationship that they know they can come to you at any point. They may stay in denial for quite some time. And unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot you can do to get them to tell you what they aren't ready to tell you yet, unfortunately. Um, but as I said, continuing to keep the lines of communication open with them, possibly even for years, to get them to come forward and tell you what's happening. I'd like to also add, if I may, that um, uh, I'll, I'll use this as an example. One of my juvenile clients, it took her two years to actually want to talk about what happened to her and actually also want to talk to law enforcement for that matter, which was never pressured on her at all. But she came to her own understanding of what justice was. And I think what we can do as social workers and healthcare providers, healthcare professionals, is, is really just provide the groundwork of what a healthy relationship is or should be, um, what justice looks like, uh, what you know potential every survivor has in healing and being a whole person. And they look for that. They look for a connection. They look for uh, representations in other human beings that this life is a better life is possible. And all you can do is plant a seed and hope that it will germinate if you don't get like a disclosure right away. And like I said, you know, this one kid took two years, two years from 14 to 16 to finally get it. And uh, these also these victims, this brings me to the other point that they're highly uh, transferable. I, the, transference is a real issue with these survivors, especially the kids. Um, so any male provider should take that into consideration because if that should come up, um, these lines can be very blurred with regard to the victim. And you take that as a responsibility upon yourself as a professional to teach about healthy friendships um, and draw that really thick boundary, which they have had erased from their definition growing up. No boundaries is like the golden rule of these victims while they're in a victimized state. They don't know, uh, and they're desperately looking for that 
either role model, father figure, or boyfriend, you know, and that's what makes them highly vulnerable. So keep that in mind. There are a lot of opportunities to plant some really healthy seeds there, but you not necessarily won't be there to watch them grow and flourish. You might be. You might get that call at 2 in the morning, you know, two or three years later um, to let you in on what's going on with your former client, and that's a great thing. But keep all of those things in mind. Great. Thank you both. Um, so as we wrap up our webinar today, there are just two pieces of information that I want to share with all of you. The first is that NITAC, we don't just offer the SOAR training. We also provide free technical assistance. If you heard something today that you feel that your organization could benefit from knowing more about or you would like to talk about some customized solutions that we could offer for you, please do reach out. Um, our email address, uh, phone number, and website are there in the chat box. Um, you also can email me directly. This is, again, this is Leilani Funaki. If you would like to hear more about ways that we could, we could help you, we um, would love to be able to do that for you. And the final piece of information is that we'll be sending out an email this afternoon with a link to our evaluation for this training. So if you are interested in receiving CEs or CEUs, you do need to complete the evaluation and you'll have until April 6th to do so. Uh, once again, thank you very much for attending the training today. We really appreciate your presence here and hope that uh, we were able to help you and provide you with information that you can take in and, and your own organizations. Um, thank you very much. Hello. Hello there. Hey, everyone. Thanks again, um, Kathy and Elizabeth. I think you did a great job, especially Catherine not feeling well. I mean, thank you for, <laughs> for hanging in there. Hopefully oh, you can yeah. recover now. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to just convalesce in my cave and hope Trump supporters will mistake, <laughs> mistake me for a hibernating bear. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for all of your work on this. Uh, I know it's like uh, been technically riddled with challenges, but thanks for this opportunity. It's been great. Oh, yeah, no, and we still had a tremendous number of people participate, even okay. though we had to reschedule on them. So, In yeah. fact, I think we still had more people uh, attend this webinar, even rescheduled, than we did in the other two. So that's, um, that's pretty that's impressive. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, so yeah. thanks again. We really do appreciate your help. I'll send an email out so we can reschedule um, our our follow-up call once we get the evaluations back in and debrief a little bit about um, what the feedback says, uh, but um, I'll, I'll probably do that Great. tomorrow morning. <laughs> it's, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Take care. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.